All right, amen. Well, it's exciting to come and worship here this morning. You know, pre-service prayer for those that come early, there are times that a song will play and people are praying and they're calling on God and sometimes a song just begins to go and lyrics begin to come out. And I know for me this morning, uh, I was hearing one song that was calling out Isaiah 40. I'm gonna read it for you this morning. I believe it's a challenge to us. Have you not known, have you not heard the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. He, he doesn't sleep on the job. Come on, God's awake already. He is ready to go. And it says he gives power to the weak and to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even though the youth shall faint and be weary and the young man shall utterly fall. But then here it is. But those that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. They that wait upon the Lord. There's a spiritual transformation or a, an exchange that takes place because I don't know about you, but there are things inside of me that are like weak, that there, there's no power left. After the end of the week, man, it's, it's maybe been a tough struggle, but they, the word says, if you will wait on the Lord, give him time, press into him, Lift your hands up. You might feel tired, but lift your hands up and God supernaturally begins to work in you. You begin to open your mouth and instead of talking about how bad the week is, you begin to say how great God is. And something begins to happen. There's an exchange that takes place. You begin to say, God, there's nothing good in the world today. Oh no, God, you're good. God, you're strong. God, you're mighty. God, you've got revelation. God, you've got encouragement. And all of a sudden we begin to change our viewpoint and begin to see who God is instead of what's going on around us. And there's an exchange that takes place. They that wait upon the Lord shall so will exchange their strength with God. So let's stand up here this morning. Let's begin to press into God. Waiting on God is not something we do where we just sit and become idle. We, we press in. We say, God, I'm going to get a hold of your strength. Give you my weakness. Get a hold of your vision. Get, a, get rid of my vision. The Lord has something. Father, we pray today, Lord, as we wait on you, God, that you will exchange our strength. You would cause, oh God, those that are faint, those that are weary, God, we will mount up with wings like eagles. We will run and, and not be weary. We'll walk and we will not faint, God, because you would want to do something in our hearts and our lives today. So God, we submit our lives. Let's worship the Lord here this morning.
us. Your intentions are good for us. You're calling out to us, saying, just come to me. I will give you rest. I will lift the burdens off your shoulders. I will give you peace.
circumstances beyond who we are and of ourselves he's going into the heart the Lord says bring me your heart don't worry about anything else if you bring the heart everything else will follow Lord God we present our hearts to you today God we bring our hearts and we say God whatever God has been holding us back in the past Lord we repent we say God we're sorry we're sorry what we made worship to be we made it to be something that we judged, something that we thought was what you wanted. But God, you just simply wanted our hearts. That if we would give you our hearts, everything else would flow to you. That everything else would come along with it. So God, right now, Lord, we, we come and we yield our heart to you. And Lord, that you would then touch our lives, our marriages and our homes. You touch our jobs and our finances. Because if you can have the heart, the heart becomes usable. The heart becomes what's changeable. The heart is what be, is transformable. And God, when our heart is yours, God, you have capacity and rule and authority into every other area of our life. So God, this morning, we yield our heart to you and say, God, take it. Take all of it. It's all yours. God, we thank you, Lord, as we sung, you chased after us. You pursued us for a relationship. Not for us to do, but for us to be with you. So Lord, we thank you for that pray that everyone that is here today, Lord, it's not by chance they're here. God, you're here to speak a, a word, to speak a, a, a heartbeat into their lives, oh Lord, of your love for them. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Well, praise God. Hey, we had some uh, visiting worship team with us here. This is Drew and Bethany Dirksen, friends from Enjoy Life. Yeah, give them a hand, man. They were awesome today. You guys are so good, so good. We have been so blessed in our, in our church, and our congregation to have worship uh, teams, and some of them are just not available here this weekend, but this couple said, yeah, we'd love to come, and they're good friends of Trent and Aniston, but uh, I've gotten to know them as well, and, and uh, Drew's mom and dad also. But uh, hey, I just want to say it's, it's great to have you here. Uh, there's some old friends that are visiting us here today. Great to have you here with us, and we look forward to connecting here. But I
want to say that it's great to have the House of God come together where you can in person, and there are many that are online and staying connected. I encourage you, uh, let us know that you're watching. Uh, type in that you're here, that you're watching alongside. Give us some comments. Uh, if you're new with us online, uh, fill out the visitor's card that we do have. And again, if you're new here this morning, it's your first time, we have visitor cards that actually get you a coffee card as well from Colombian that we just want to bless you to make sure that you uh, just sort of remember us and we want to bless you with that. So uh, be mindful of that. We have a couple of announcements, as we, but as we make way part of the continued life of the house of God is that we would bring what it's called, bring in our tithe into the storehouse, which is the local church, and our tithe is really the 10% of our finances in the earth that God blesses us with. Uh, Psalm 24 says that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, and we realize that everything that we have really comes from God. And uh, tithe, bringing back into the house of God is so that the, the house, the staff, and the ministry here, but also in Jamaica and various other places that we help out, uh, is able to continue uh, ministering out. So that's where uh, that goes. Uh, we do want you to fill out your prayer cards and allow us to pray for you. Um, you know, we're going through a time in the world where there are a lot of, maybe you're affected or you have families that are affected, maybe through COVID or finances or situations. Well, we want to stand in the gap for you. Uh, we, we are called to pray for one another. And so let us know how we can pray for you and the leadership team. We'd love to be able to do that. I'm going to have um, Sarah come up and give us an announcement regarding uh, the young adults. I know we had a great event recently. A nice fire took place and a whole bunch of people came over, but let's see what's happening. Yeah, um, so on young adults, um, this Friday we're going to be meeting again for a fire um, at my place from 7 to 9 p.m. Um, so everyone is invited, bring friends, just come hang out. We um, roasted some hot dogs and marshmallows last time, but this time um, we're also going to do a pumpkin carving contest, so do something a little bit fun. Um, it's going to be outside. Um, so bring a chair if you need to or anything at all. Bring some friends. Come hang out for a little bit. Um, but it's going to be really fun. If you do need a pumpkin, you can just let me know. I can pick you up one or you can grab one yourself. Um, but that's all you got to bring. So, yeah, we'll see you Friday. All right. Are you making some pumpkin pies with whatever you carve out? No, probably not. Okay. <laughs> well, um, yeah, I do want to say that... Um, you know, this is a, a, probably a great time to invite people to church, invite people to connect with the young adults. I know the women are having a, a Bible study that has taken place, and they've had a, a couple nights of that already. Um, but God wants to connect us together. And as I've said, you know, the gathering is important. It's important that we gather together. Hebrews says that we don't forsake the gathering, but also connection that we would connect with one another. Gathering's important, but connect. How do you, can you connect? Well, you connect through the young adults. You connect through the women's ministry. You connect when we have uh, our prayer on Wednesday nights. You connect on Sunday. Somehow, find a connection because we're not meant to do this alone, not meant to walk alone and be a part of things just by ourselves. Hey, we're going to dismiss the children's ministry. Uh, can make their way uh, with Aniston out the side there. And uh, great to have uh, the families in the house of God. Um, God is growing his church. You know, Jesus said that he's building his ch church in the gates of hell, the dark forces, anything that would want to separate God's people from the house. You know, God says, I'm building. We want to be building what God's building. There's only really one thing that God's building in the earth, and that is he's building his church. We know he's building a, a place for us in heaven, and John uh, uh, chapter 14 tells us that, that we don't have to worry. He is building a place. But here on earth, we are building the church. Well, hey, let's open up our Bibles here this morning. We're going to look at uh, a beautiful story that uh, I trust will encourage you. Uh, how many here have ever noticed that not just with other people, but even with your own life, we're quick to disqualify ourselves from what God wants us to do? It's amazing how God will ask us to do something, and we, we quickly say, well, but God, you got the right person? God, are you sure you want to talk? Are you talking about me? God, do you know my life and what I've been through? God, do you know how bad it has been? And you know, the Bible is full of people just like that. And it tells us that God is aware of your life and my life. You know, I think of uh, Moses, the great prophet of the Old Testament, uh, the leader, the great uh, national leader and deliverer. But I think of Exodus chapter 3 and how God called Moses, you know, spoke out of a burning bush for him. and says, this is what I got you to do. And the thing that God, Moses did is he came up with excuses. 
He came up with excuses about why he couldn't do what God's asking him to do. He came up with things like this. I'm not good enough. Anybody ever said that to God? God, I'm not good enough. God, I'm not able to do what you're asking me to do, that I should bring Israel out of Egypt. Then he came up and he says, but, but I don't have all the answers. He says, you know, they're going to ask me who you are, God, and I don't even know your name. And sometimes we go, well, God, I didn't go to Bible college. I don't have the training. I don't have all the bill. I don't have all the knowledge. So, God, you're, you really shouldn't be using me. Uh, or how about suppose they won't believe me when I tell them that you are you going to use me? And how many times we go and go, God, you know, if somebody of another stature, some of another reputation, somebody's been around longer, they'll believe them, but they're not going to believe me. And then he says, you know, he says, I'm a terrible public speaker. He says, I'm slow of speech. He says, my, my tongue doesn't really work well. I've got to stutter. It's not, God, you need to get somebody else that can speak better than me. And finally, he says, you know what, God? Use anybody else you can find. I'm not qualified. He had all these excuses. But, you know, it wasn't just this Moses. It was, it was a young man by the name of Gideon as well. So don't just think it's the older people that have excuses. Come on, it's the younger people that have excuses too. And we got a young man by the name of Gideon, and, and he's afraid. He's hiding out and threshing the wheat in the uh, wine press where all the Philistines and the enemies are all around. And all of a sudden, he's hunkered down, and, he, and he's just, just barely eking out an existence. And God comes and says, thou mighty man of valor. He says, I'm going to use you to deliver. And he says, hold it. You got the wrong guy. He says, first of all, he says, God, I'm not seeing any miracles in my own life. I'm not seeing anything happening in my life. How do I have that spiritual ability to do anything like this when it's not even happening, happening for my life? And then he says, do you know my family? Do you know where I'm coming from? Do you know the family I'm born out of? It's the least in the nation. And he says, by the way, me, I, I, I'm really the smallest, the youngest. It's, I really don't have the impact. And we look at these guys like Moses and Gideon, old and young, and we go, you know what? We're just like them. And God knows that we have this propensity inside of us to always to turn and say, God, use somebody else. God, I'm not good enough. I don't have the ability to do what you want. And we go, God, you know what? In this area of my life, I'm disqualified. What happened to me disqualifies me. The family I came from disqualified. Do you know my parents? Man, my parents, you know what kind of upbringing I had? Do you know how bad it was? Do you know the mistakes I've made? And we just go on to the shortcomings, limitations, struggles, and we say, God, you can't use me. I'm disqualified. And we disqualify ourselves before God even has a chance to talk to you. And we go, because of my expectations of what I think I should be like, I disqualify myself. I don't have what it takes. And we say, God can't use me because of, and right now in your mind, you've got something that you're saying, because of this. Yeah, I really don't think God could use me. Or I don't think God should use me. I failed. Maybe we list our resume. I, I, I failed. I, I, I've been into sin. I, I've been in brokenness. Maybe I'm single. I can't do this. I'm divorced. I can't do this. Uh, I have issues in my life. You don't know the problems I've had growing up. But listen, there's not one of us that right now in this place of life, God still doesn't have a purpose for you. That in this stage of life, in this place of life, in this struggle of life, in this place of brokenness that you happen to be, God still has a purpose for you. God does not take away the purpose for your life because you've gone through difficulties. God knows what you've been through, and yet he still has a purpose for you. He still has somebody that you're to reach out to, you're to touch, you're to heal, you're to bring hope to. Every one of us has a calling to be an ambassador of hope. Oh, no, I, I, I couldn't bring hope to anybody because you don't know how bad my life is. It's not because of your life that you bring hope. It's because of the Christ inside of you that you can bring hope. The message of hope is not about your mess. The message of hope is about the mess that Christ brought you out of, of sin so that you can become a son and daughter, and now you're qualified because of what Christ has done for you. Yes, you're in brokenness. Yes, you're in hurt. Yes, you're in turmoil. But God says, I still have a purpose for you, and God wants to use you even in the difficulties of life, where you're bruised, where you're broken, where you're injured, and the trials and tragedies of life have dealt some blows to your life. But let me tell you, it's not because, because of what you've been through 
because of those circumstances, you become qualified. Because you are uniquely qualified now to reach people that you never could reach. You're uniquely qualified because of your brokenness now to reach people that you never could have. Out of your injuries and hurts and out of the mess you came out of, you're uniquely qualified for God to use you. You know, I think of the Apostle Paul who called out to God. He had a thorn in his flesh. We don't know what the thorn was. We don't know exactly what this messenger was to buffet him was. We don't know if it was a physical infirmity that he had. We don't know. Some say it was his eyesight, that he was, there was a blindness in him that he wasn't able to see properly. Uh, we don't know uh, if it's an area of illness, uh, of sickness that he had to deal with reoccurring. But what he did is he prayed three times to God. He says, God, I want you to take this away. Not just once did he pray that, he prayed through. This is the Apostle Paul, the one that wrote half the New Testament. He, he calls out to God and says, God, will you take this from me? And God said, no. No, he says, you're going to have to deal with it, live with it, suffer with it, and maybe even carry shame because of it. And as he prayed to God, God gave him this word out of 2 Corinthians chapter 9. For chapter 12, verse 9 to 11, he says, But he, God said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast, I will glory, I will exalt, it says, all the more gladly about my weakness, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, it says, for Christ's sake, for Christ's sake, he says, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I'm weak, then I am strong. You know, we're quick to quote this and put it on a coffee mug and put it on a T-shirt, you know, talking about how great God's grace is sufficient for us and his favor and empowering presence is there to deal with in our situations, our, our str struggles, our trials. His grace is there, and he is. But the grace that comes there for you to help you and to cover you, to strengthen you, to empower you in your time of weakness isn't just for you. You see, the grace of God comes in at a time of our weakness, not just to build us up in our weakness, but then it, grace can work through us in the ministry and purposes that God has for us. He works as a, us as a conduit. When grace comes to us, it doesn't pool and all of a sudden reside. It begins to work in us to go through us so that we can reach others in our weakness, in our difficulties, in our tragedies of life. The grace can work through us. The grace that is sufficient for you is to go through you and minister to others. You're saved by grace through faith. It is a gift, Ephesians 2. It's a saving grace, but that's strength that God wants to give to you not just to pull you out of your wickedness and your sin and your disobedience and pull you up into newness of life, but that grace that God wants to bestow upon you, not just that salvation, but every day as we walk with the Lord, is to work through you. It's so that you, in your weakness, you can reach out. In your brokenness, you can touch others. Through, through your tragedies of life, through your losses, the grace of God comes to you to work through you because there's people that you need to minister to. And too often we think, well, as soon as the grace heals me, then I can get this other grace to, to minister to people. And God says, no, the grace I'm giving you to heal you is the same grace to reach through you to heal other people. You know, there are times we can find a passage in the Bible that all of a sudden just, we're not too sure why it's there. We think about it, we study, and we go, yeah, I'm not too sure if I'll even go to this one again. But we go to read these scriptures, and God has lessons for us, even in what seems to be obscure, mysterious kind of passages. Well, we're going to hit one of those. In 1 Kings chapter 20, if you go to it, we've got some history of Israel, God's people. God's people, after Solomon was into the northern tribes and the southern tribes, one called Israel and one called Judah. Uh, and out of 19 wicked kings and one wicked queen, uh, Israel would have a go at it. And God was constantly working in Israel and correcting them and dealing with them. But the wickedness always continued to, to rule in Israel. And we got in First Kings 20, we got a king by the name of Ahab. Well, Ahab was a wicked king. I mean, his wickedness was brought to another level when he married Jezebel, <laughs> all right? And Jezebel was responsible for harlotry and idolatry in Israel. Well, all of a sudden, this, this wickedness is pervasive in there. Well, God sends a, an army by the, the, the Syrian army, and 
King Abinadab to come up against Israel. But God had a plan for the Syrian army, and God wanted to destroy the Syrian army. Well, we read in 1 Kings 19 that God brought victory in the mountains, and then God brought victory in the valleys. He's the God of the mountains, God of the valleys. It's all great. But God wanted victory over the Syrian army and over Abinadab because they were wicked as well. So all of a sudden, uh, uh, King Ahab gets his armies and goes against the Syrian and, and destroys them. And all of a sudden, they're all fleeing. And, and King Abinadab, he flees and he's safe. Well, King Ahab was told to go after them and deal with them. But what does he do? He has a treaty. He says, you know what? I don't really need to really kill you. How about if I just use you? And he got into a treaty, got into an economic treaty to help his own nation get better instead of trusting God. So God is upset with this because Ahab didn't do what he was supposed to do. He disobeyed God. So we read in, in 1 Kings 20 of the sons of the prophets. Now the sons of the prophets go all the way back to Samuel's day where Samuel was raising up the prophets, had a school of the prophets, and we read in uh, the uh, under Elijah and Elisha, the sons of the prophets at that time, watching what's going on, all right? But we've got the sons of the prophets, and we've got one son of the prophet who gets a word from God. And he says, I want you to give this word to Ahab because he disobeyed me. So Ahab, and we pick up this story here now in 1 Kings 20, verse 35. And this is what takes place. By the word of the Lord, one of the company of the prophets said to his companion, his neighbor, strike me with your weapon. But he refused. So the prophet said, because you did not obey the Lord, as, you, as soon as you leave me, a lion will kill you. <laughs> and, after the, and after that man went away, a lion found him and killed him. The prophet found another man and said, strike me, please, inflict a wound. So the man struck him and wounded him. <laughs> so let, let me begin with this. There are lessons to be learned in all these things, all right? We can't take the lessons too far, but this is a recurring lesson throughout Scripture, all right? Not the lion part, okay? Not the lion part, but the part about this is the, the prophet found somebody else quickly to do what the Lord wanted to do. And the point is, is that there are times when God asks us to do something and we say no, and not a lion's going to maybe get a hold of us, but God's going to raise up somebody else to do what God wants done. That if God wants something done in the earth and he asks you and you say no, God's got a man or a woman waiting in the wings that he's going to use them to do what God wants done in the earth. And I believe it's just an understanding that God, when he lays opportunities before you, when he lays situations before you, when he stirs your heart, when he calls you out of yourself to begin to do something, be careful how you respond to God. Because God might say, well, if you're not willing to do it, then I'll ask somebody else to do it. And I believe God's got a purpose for every one of us, that we need to be those that are leaning in, hearing from God, saying, God, what is it that you want me to do? When God asks you to do it, you're willing to say yes. I'm not saying there's a line that's going to come after you, but you think that one through, that could God maybe want to do something to stir you up to make sure that you do what God wants done? He's always calling us. It might be that God has to go get somebody right off of drugs, heal them out of the drug situation to do what you didn't, weren't willing to do. Maybe get a homeless person off the street, get him into the church, and get him to do what you were not willing to do. God will do what it takes to do what he needs done in the earth with a willing servant. All of a sudden, the the first man is asked to do it. No, lion comes along. So he goes to his other friend. I can imagine this. He goes to his other friend. Hey, hey, saw what happened. Eh? Would you inflict a wound on me? And I could just see him pulling the sheath, the, the sword out of the sheath, and he said, yeah, where do you want it? Where do you want it? I'll do it. How many times do you want it? I'm not going to get eaten by another lion. I'll do it. I'll give you extra cuts. So he's ready to go. So he pulls out the, the sword, and, and he goes after him, and he inflicts a wound. He's cut. He's bleeding. All of a sudden, he needs bandages. His body that was whole is now wounded. It's bruised. It's cut. He's bleeding. And then it says in the story, it says that he goes to where King Ahab was coming by his chariot. And all of a sudden, he just sits down right where, where the king's going to come. He sits down. He's bandaged. He's bleeding. And all of a sudden, the, the, the King Ahab goes by, and he notices him. 
You see, King Ahab would have had a lot of people coming up to give him words, to give him encouragement, to give him direction. I've got a word of the Lord for you. Well, King Ahab's not going to stop for those people. Anybody that comes in, you know, just push him away. But all of a sudden, he sees this man, and he says, here's a soldier. Here's a soldier that's got the wars of battle, the scars of battle. He's got bandages. He's been bleeding. Something has happened to him, and it draws his attention to the man to hear what has taken place. The son of the prophet knew, I and myself cannot go to that man, but I know that if I have an inflicted wound, that if I have bandages, I will draw his attention to me so that I can speak the word into his life. How often we think it's talent, education, prestige that gets us a seat at the table. Somebody's life, somebody's marriage, somebody's home, somebody's difficult life, somebody's walking all of a sudden the narrowness of life and they're not going where they need to go and you think it's your talent that they're going to listen to, your education they're going to listen to, your prestige they're going to, no, they're not going to listen to that. But when they know you've walked the same path and you're carrying the scars because of that path, you can walk alongside of them. And now you've got an opening to speak in their life. There's a weightiness that comes in your words. When out of your brokenness and your wounds, you're able to say, I've been there. I've walked through it. You, you get their attention. They look to you because they say, here's a man and a woman. that They've gone through difficulties of life. They've been wounded. They've got scars. They hear the struggles and sorrows in your speech. They know you know what it is you're talking about. Not because you read it, not because you watched it, not because you can emulate it in some way, because it's written on the inside of you. And you're still dealing with it. There's still brokenness in you. There's still woundedness in you. But because of that, there's a weightiness to your words that you can speak the, the word of God. You can speak the authority of God. You can speak the life of God in them. Too often we come to other people and we hold up our trophies. We hold up our trophies and go, look at my life here, look at the trophy. When it's not the trophy they want to see, they want to see the scars. It's the scars that carry the weight. It's the scars that say you fought battles, some you've won, some you've lost, but you're still fighting. It's not the talent and education, it's not the trophies to carry the weight of God's word into other people's life. It's the scars that we've gone through, the brokenness. There's an authority, there's a legitimacy because of the bruising that you've had in life. The prophet reveals himself to, to King Ahab and he speaks his word. And this is the response that we find in verse 43 of King Ahab. This, this man, this man that is full of wickedness and full of hardness of heart. His heart, heart would be so hard because of what he's been doing and Jezebel and the, the prophets of Baal and Ashtaroth and all the life he's been given in. But it says in verse 43, so the king Israel went to his house sullen and displeased. And he came to Samaria. The words of a man who himself was wounded was able to speak into the hardness of a heart and pierce that heart and cause there to be sullenness. There's something that the words attached to him and affected him. You know, we all want perfect families, don't we? We want perfect marriages. We want perfect circumstances of life, finances, health, we just want everything to be so perfect. We don't want issues. We don't want pain. We don't want drama. We don't want the sorrows of life, you know. God, keep me from all those things. And yet, they do happen. Jesus said, in life, you will have tribulation. I don't, there's some scriptures I don't like. I'll be honest with you. I don't like that one. It's like I wish I didn't have to have that one in my Bible. But Jesus says, in this life, you will have tribulations. Offenses will come. Difficulties will come. But be of good cheer, I've overcome them. There's a plan, there's a future for you. But Jesus says they will come. Trials, difficulties, suffering. But here's the point, when they do happen, not if, but when they do happen, why do you think all of a sudden we're disqualified for God using us? God said they'd come. God said that there'll be uh, people rising up against people, family members against family members. There will be destruction. There'll be hurts. There'll be persecution. And why are we surprised when God says that and then he calls us to do something? We go, oh, no, 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 God, I'm disqualified because of all these problems in my life. 
It's like, hold it now. Why do they disqualify you? Those things should qualify you. They qualify you to complete what God's calling you to do. The prophet said, God, if this is what it takes, if this is what I've got to do to go and be the man that I need to be to put a word into King Ahab's life, then God, whatever it is. Now, we don't go looking for it. We don't go asking for it. But we realize God uses our bruises. God uses our bruises. My grace is sufficient for you because it says in your weakness, my strength is made perfect. In your infirmities, in your difficulties, in your trials and tribulations, my grace comes to you and then flows through you. God uses our wounds because our wounds carry a voice. When we walk with God, our wounds carry a voice of authority. See, there's hurting men and women that are living in a hurting world that needs to hear from you. Not from me, from you. From you and your wounds, you and your brokenness, you and your difficulties of life. Your hurts and bruises that you've lived through, they have a message. Your hurts and wounds and your failures and brokenness don't disqualify you. They actually qualify you. There are people that only you can reach that I'll never reach, that your neighbor will never reach, your husband, your spouse, your children won't. You know, I find it interesting that God is able to take men and women out of the worst of the background, out of the most difficulties of broken homes, of parents that they were divorced or single parents, men and women that were addicts and prostitutes and thieves throughout Scripture, and they became fathers and mothers to sons and daughters that God was able to use. You know, Joseph, I think of Joseph's confession in Genesis 49, verse 20. He's looking at his family, his brothers. He says, but as for you, my family, my brothers, he says, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order, in order. There's a purpose behind it. The, the, the evil, the wickedness, the trials, the difficulties, in order to bring about as it is this day to save many people alive. The evil that came into Joseph's life, you think about the years of rejection and betrayal and false imprisonment. He says, I'm not defined by my bruises. I'm not defined by my hurts and my woundedness. I'm not defined by those things. There's a greater purpose that was working inside of it. Those things that I would say would disqualify me actually qualified me to save many people alive. God's grace is greater than my bruises. He uses my, but you know what? We have to choose. Will we be bitter or will we be better? Will we succumb to the difficulties of life and let them mold us or will we let God's grace mold us? Listen, God wants you to hear this. God can use the wound, the hurt, the pain and failure and the disease, that loss in your life right now before you're healed. While you're being healed, while grace is being poured onto your life, God has a purpose through it to minister to other people. Well, no, no, when, when, when I'm all healed up, then, then God can use me. No, God says in, in the wound, in the brokenness, while I'm working my life and purposes in you, I'm using you to reach other people. In Furnace Chronicles 1.16, we read in the genealogy of David's sister by the name of Zariah. She had three sons, Abishai, Joab, and Ashiel. This is the daughter of Jesse, King David's sister. We don't know why she was given this name. We know circumstances were obviously behind many of the naming of individuals. But this name, Zariah, means my wound. Wound, pain, tribulation. You know, we think in the Bible of Jacob's son, Benjamin, Jacob's favorite son. When he was born, he was not always born Benjamin. Rachel's mother, when she was about to give birth, she died giving birth. And out of the pain and sorrow, she, she named him Benoni, which means sorrowful, son of my sorrow. And Jacob steps in and says, no, you're not going to be son of my sorrow. I'm not going to let you walk around with that kind of name. I'm going to call you Benjamin, son of my right hand. And all of a sudden, he carried with him that promise of kings coming out through the lineage. You know, I think of the ark of God in 2 Samuel 6 when the Philistines came into God's people and came against them. And because of their, their, their failure to really press in and hold on to God, the ark of God was taken out of Israel and the Philistines took it. 
And news came back to Israel, and there was a priest by the name of Eli. He was, he was, he was blind, and he wasn't doing things that were right. And all of a sudden, he dies, and this, this young priest woman, our wife, says, that's my father-in-law. He dies. And then gets news that her husband, one of the sons of Eli, he dies, and she goes into birth, and she gives birth to a son. And she says, I'm going to call him Ichabod for the glory of Speaking of the ark has departed, the glory has departed. And she put a word into the next generation. The glory has departed. But not Zariah. We read about her. She's wounded. She's hurt. We don't know what the wounds are. We don't, we don't know if she's carrying them physically. But somehow there was, a, there was a, a reaffirmation all the time that she's wounded. She's sorrowful. There's tribulations, difficulties of life. But you know, something happened in her life that trumped the wounding in her life. Because you read about her three sons. You read about these three sons. She did not transfer her issues over to her sons. She transferred the promises of God to her sons. She transferred the hope and the confidence and the courage that was there and available. We read of Joab. He became a four-star general in David's army. David knew he was a man he could trust, and every time he went out to war, Joab led the army, and there was victory after victory after victory. He was a man of might. He was a man of strength. He was a man of leadership. And then we read of his next, the next son. We read, we read of uh, uh, the next son, Abishai, in 2 Samuel 21. David's an old man. He's tired. He's weary, but he's still got some fire in his belly. There's a he was the only one that was the killer of a giant, a giant killer. This was David. Well, there's a son of the giant that came out one day, and he comes out, and he's got a seven-pound spear. That's how big he was. And it says he had a new sword, and his purpose was to slay David. He comes out against David, old and tired, a little weary. Sure, he can fight still, but can he fight this Goliath-like man, this giant? Abishai runs out. Here comes all of a sudden his sister's son running out ahead of him, and he slays the giant. Those issues weren't transferred over to him. He got a hold of the promises of God. He got a hold of the purposes. He got a hold of the anointing of God. Here's a man that was able to say, I will too will be a giant killer in the earth. And he ran out and brought victory. Those issues of anxiety and depression never transferred. He became a giant killer, and the last one was Asael. His name is, listen to this, his name means made by God. He wasn't made by fear. He wasn't made by tribulation. He wasn't made by sorrow. He was made by God. Not by the wounds of a mother, the wounds uh, uh, of a mother, the fears and the situations of life. Uh, Blame it on my growing up. Blame it on my past. Blame it on where I came from. No, he says, I'm made by God. And God formed him and fashioned him. And it says in 2 Samuel 2.18, he was celebrated not for where he came from. He wasn't celebrated because merely he overcame some difficulties. No, he was celebrated because it says he was fast on foot. He was swift. He was a runner. And in warfare, a runner had great prestige. So all of a sudden, Zariah, a woman, carried wounds all her life, but instead of letting her wounds produce bitterness, pain, depression, addiction, she raised sons with confidence, courage, and belief in themselves and belief in a God that had promised life to them. They became a four-star general, a giant killer, and one that was swift in foot. Don't tell me you're disqualified because of where you came from, because of what's happened to you. Because of the circumstances, the pain, the brokenness, the the mistakes of life. God's called you beyond that. And God, even in the brokenness, God has a purpose for you. We all have wounds. We all have failures. You don't see them. You think this 10-inch mask is covering us. We've got another mask that we're all wearing. It's a mask that covers our vulnerabilities, our brokenness, our hurts. We don't want anybody to see it. Because if they really saw our brokenness... I wouldn't have a place, we say. We say, well, God couldn't use me. We all have brokenness, failures. We've all received injuries, suffered damages, distress, loss. But the question is, what will they produce in your life? What will you let them produce in you? Will they produce rebellion where you say, no, God, I'm not. 
I won't get involved. We have excuses, resentment. When God asks you, you, you hold up these as excuses and say, well, no, God, I can't because of this. And it's like God says, you think that surprises me? Do you know I already knew about that? I already knew what you were going to do. I already knew the brokenness and failures and situations. I know the beginning from the end and the end from the beginning. I know it all, but yet I still have a purpose for you. Well, no, God, I can't because of this. It's like, well, you know I'm sovereign, right? You know I'm omnipotent, omniscient. You know I, I have all knowing of everything. And yet I called you to do this. Or will these things that happen in your life produce life, produce blessing, hope? Not just for you, but in the next generation. I love it when I see and I know certain things in people's lives, and yet, you know what I'm hearing from them? I'm seeing in their Facebook. I'm seeing on their Twitter. I'm seeing, I'm seeing the hope. I'm seeing the promises. I'm seeing the visitation of God in their lives, although they're still working through their brokenness and their wounds. You know what they have? They have a voice of God's promise, of God's victory, of God's deliverance. Even in the midst of it. You know, Paul had intellect. He was gifted. He was educated. He had the right upbringing. But he didn't glory in any of that. You read Philippians. He says, that's dung. He says, I count that as dung. Think about it. He says, all those things that the world has acclaimed to and, and that I should exalt. He says, no, nah, that's just dung. It's garbage. He says, what I do boast in is my infirmity so Christ's power could rest in me. My weakness, my trials, my difficulties. I boast in those. I don't want them. <laughs> but I boast in them so that God's power can be in me. You know, when you read Paul's resume, when you read Paul's resume and the, the things that he happened to go through in life, I mean, it's pretty incredible. He was in prison frequently, flogged severely, exposed to death again and again, five times received from the Jews, 40 lashes minus, minus one. That's what Jesus had. Three times he was beaten with rods. Once he was pelted with stones. Three times he was shipwrecked, spent a night and a day in the open sea. It says he was in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, from fellow Jews and from Gentiles, danger in the city, in the country and sea, danger from false believers. Believers. Man, this guy was bruised, wounded, and beaten. And it's amazing how we want to have the results of a Paul's life, but we don't want the resume of a Paul's life. Oh, God, if you could just use me to, man, turn hundreds to you. God, if I could speak a word, and, or I can have healings, and I can have deliverance, and prisons open up, and God, all of a sudden, I can do all these great things for you. Are you willing to have the resume of Paul? Nah, I'm not really into that. But you got, I, I, you could use me. But it's through the brokenness and the wounds and the difficulties of life that God says that presents you in such a unique way to reach people even while you're broken, even while you're wounded, even while you're bruised. Stop thinking about what you've been through that disqualifies you and begin to say, God, how can you use me? even in my woundedness, even in my bruise. Get involved. Don't let your excuses be really seeds of rebellion. Ouch. Because that's what they are. Excuses are seeds of rebellion that you rely on your excuses to a point that ultimately you go and you say, no, God. But God, can you use me? But I've got all these excuses. God's grace is sufficient, not just for you, and, but to get through you for your struggles to affect other people and touch other people and bring hope to them. You know, I think of Abraham's his grandson, Jacob, had an encounter one night with God. He got alone with God, and he's wrestling with the man of God, God himself, and he calls out and says, God, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. And I don't know if he really understood what the blessing was going to be because the blessing wasn't just a name change that he went from conniver, supplanter, from Jacob to that deceiver spirit to Israel, a, a prince with God. But God came and he touched him in the hem. That he would walk forever with a limp. That he would walk forever in a brokenness. But Jacob, with a brokenness, was able to raise 12 sons that became not just Israel, but became the cradle from which Jesus Christ was born. The womb from which he was born and the cradle that he was offered unto. Too often we, we think the blessing of God is, oh Lord, enlarge my life, bless my life, make me this, 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 all the beautiful things of life. And sometimes the blessing of life is God wants you to walk wounded. 
Walk wounded so you can reach people that are wounded, so that you can minister to them. God uses your bruises, your wounds, your brokenness. Don't let it be an excuse. I love how Paul says, you know, we have treasure in earthen vessels, clay. But can I tell you, the light, the treasure that's in the earthen vessel comes out through the cracks. You keep it tight, you keep it shut up tight, you put a lid on it, the light will never come out, but all of a sudden, when there's a crack in the treasure, that earthen vessel, what happens? Light begins to come out. It begins to carry water, and as the water is carried in the pot, all of a sudden the water begins to fall, and all of a sudden it leaves a trail that all of a sudden beautiful flowers begin to grow because of the pouring out through the cracks of your life. That only happens as we're handled and mishandled, as we're bruised, and as we find wounds. I want to show you a picture up here. Kintsugi is a Japanese art form. I've taken broken pottery pieces and they put them back together with gold. They bring the fine fabric of gold, as it were, the liquid gold, and it's used to hold the pieces back together. And it's built on this idea that in embracing flaws and imperfections, you can create an even stronger and more beautiful piece of art. Every break is unique. And instead of repairing them like new, this 40-year-old, 400-year-old technique actually highlights the scars as part of the design. Its value, its renown, its usability, the presence of it now has a greater impact because of its brokenness. Because the pieces were brought together by the master designer and gold was laid so that the pieces would come together and beauty would be seen. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. God's grace, your bruises. Let his grace be sufficient. Let his grace come, his strength come to perfect your weakness in your brokenness, the pieces. And here's my challenge to every one of you. Will you bring your pieces, your wounded, your brokenness, the pieces of your life, and will you give them to God, the master designer, the master craftsman? In your brokenness, give it to God so that as he's molding you back, as he's pouring the gold of his presence into your life and healing you, he's also using you. There are people right now that are hurting that need to hear from you that needs you to walk alongside of them as God's mending you and building you and encouraging you. But can I say this? If all you're doing is holding your brokenness, the pieces right now, and you're holding on tight to the pieces, your hands are so closed on, their, on your wounds, you go, here they are, they're, the wounds, I'm holding them, my pieces, I'm, they're broken, I'm, they're in my grip, I'm, I'm just holding on to them. God can't heal them until you give them to them. But God can't use you when your hands are clutched around them. Your hands have to come open. Your hands have to be available so God's grace can flow in you to heal you, but then use you to touch others. And that's the beautiful challenge of God's grace. God's grace is sufficient for you because his Strength is made perfect in our weakness, but it's through you that he can touch others. Will you say yes to whatever God's asking you to do? Stop with the excuses. Don't wait to be healed. God uses you in the healing process. I really felt that today is the day that the Lord wants to set people free, to release those things that you've been holding on to that have become an excuse of why God can't use you. God wants you to let them go and present them to him, the master craftsman, and let him reassemble your life. We read in Scripture, this is all things are passed away. All things become new. That's what the Lord wants to do in your life. I have the worship team come back up. I believe this as we come to a close here. I believe the Lord just wants to speak into our heart and our lives there's a whisper that is found right now in the congregation. 
And I believe it's the whisper of the Lord, the whisper of the Lord that just wants to speak into your life. And here's what I'd like to do is we're not going to stand at first. As the musicians begin to play and call on the Lord, would you just settle down for a moment? Just put your books down, your Bible down, and maybe even close your eyes for a moment and let the Holy Spirit ask you this question. Are you still going to hold your brokenness up as an excuse? Are you going to let go of the broken pieces so God can mend them, but then uh, God can also use you in this season of healing of your life? God doesn't stop his purposes in your life because of a difficulty in a situation, a trial, a wounding. God says that's an opportunity. It's an opportunity to use you. With your eyes closed right now, Holy Spirit, would you speak to us right now? What's the excuse we've been using that's been really been a seed of rebellion that we need to say no more? I'm not going to use this as an excuse anymore. I'm going to bring my brokenness to you right now and offer it up. And by doing so, Lord, we can release our hands to become ministers, to become servants, to become tools, oh God, that you can use to minister to other people. Right now, Holy Spirit, will you go over our congregation, those that are watching online, and Holy Spirit, would you just speak into their hearts right now? God, your love for them, your desire for them, your willingness, Lord, if only they will receive the voice of God in their life. Holy Spirit, I thank you. You're a gentle Holy Spirit but you want to do a supernatural work in our lives right now. Young or old, oh God, Moses or Gideon, we've got excuses no more. We surrender and we say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord. Whatever you want from us in Jesus' name. Let's sing and worship the Lord with this beautiful song here. Let's stand.
thank you that we can pour our hearts out to you, Lord. God, we pray, oh Lord, that you would respond and mold us and shape us. Lord, as we lay our lives like clay on the potter's table, God, as you begin to spin us around, your hands come upon us to shape us and form us. God, that we can be that beautiful vessel, Lord, but in our brokenness, you come and you repair, you pour your anointing, pour your spirit. God, that we become this beautiful, beautiful reclaimed vessel, Lord, that your grace can be shown and be revealed. God, I pray for anyone that's going through trials and difficulties today, Lord. God, that they would be quick, quick to give their brokenness to you, not hold and make it become bitterness. Don't let it become anger. Don't let it become hostility towards you. But God, that we can release it to you, oh God. And in that, oh God, the master craftsman can come and minister to our lives and then use us to serve other people, to serve them and minister to them. Father God, I thank you what you're building. You're building your church. We're all broken pieces coming together into this thing called the church. God, we welcome one another in our brokenness to be fitted together, Lord, to a beautiful thing. We bless you in Jesus' name. Well, praise the Lord. Great to be in the house today. And I encourage you, walk with the Lord. Walk with the word and worship and prayer. Make him a priority in your life, and you'll find that he will transform you and change you into that which you know you want to become. God bless you. We'll see you again soon. Wednesday night prayer, 7 o'clock. Ladies on Wednesday nights as well, and the young adults on Friday night. God bless you. And stay connected with one another.